But my journey in search of the country's most fabulous flora turned out quite difficult. Of course, I realized that my journey would be full of obstacles, but nobody warned me that reptiles would literally jump into my car. You know, you're going somewhere minding your own business, and all of a sudden you're told that there's a black mamba here. Not that the guys are calling for backup, but they have guns. And look. Oh, I can see it. Yeah, there it is. There it is. It's very dangerous, right? Yes, it is. There is the tail. The most important thing is not to approach it from the front. Oh, its head's turned out to be here, and I thought it was there. Stupid me. And its head was looking at me the whole time. I've already found it. Oh, I see it. Can you see it? Here is the snake's head. Oh, guys, the black mamba is the queen of all the most horrible snakes in the world. It's not only speed that kills, this snake is fast. Its venom is the most fast acting in the world. If I'm unlucky enough to get bitten, I will die immediately. This mamba fell victim to its love of warmth. It was hit by a car. Actually, this is a big problem in such places. Snakes slither out onto the asphalt, warmed by the sun, and die under the wheels. But this one was lucky, I'm happy to say. You know, it's great that the guys didn't kill it. They just let it escape into the wild. They did their job. Guys, we've seen one of the most horrible symbols of Africa, the black mamba. Guys, thank you for doing such a great job. By the way, this gigantic continent, which greeted me with such fervor, is considered to be the ancestral home of humanity. The most ancient remains of our ancestors were discovered here, and I have to explore South Africa using all the knowledge we've accumulated from the beginning of civilization to understand what plant could be called the local symbol. This continent covers one-fifth of the Earth's land area. Just think of it, 9,600 species of various plants, not to mention animals and insects. I'm in South Africa, and real adventures are just waiting for me. I'll tell you what I want to show you first. The place where life on the planet probably originated. This is truly an unexplored wilderness, and it makes me quite nervous to plunge into it without a guide. You know, here in South Africa, we're looking for the living symbols of this country. But this could be considered a non-living symbol. Probably this stone was here at the origin of life on our planet. First of all, how old is this stone? This boulder of sandstone is 3 billion, 200 million years old. Let me stand next to it, next to this rock. Well, the elderly have to be treated with respect. This stone is very old. It's much older than me. We can see these small, thin black lines on it. These are cyanobacterial mats fossilized on the seashore. Tony is an expert, an ecologist, and he can say those kinds of words easily. But I had to really think hard to remember that cyanobacteria are actually blue-green algae, and mats are their communities. These are the most ancient organisms on our planet. Did life begin here? Life began here. In South Africa? Right. Revelation number one. Great. Okay. This place is not necessarily the only place where life originated, but these mountains have provided more evidence that life originated here than any other place. I feel the life. Warm and pleasant. Right, it's really warm. The feeling that I've stumbled upon a world full of wonders has never left me the whole time I've traveled around in search of the living symbols of this country. I've already seen the local giant animals, and the plants are not to be diminished either. The baobab tree is already so huge that nobody would notice if it gained or lost any weight. 
it's very pulpy and spongy. So in the rainy season, it absorbs water like a sponge. It's said that a fully grown tree can absorb over 25,000 gallons of water. Just amazing. As you surely haven't forgotten, I'm still in South Africa, in the northern part of South Africa, to be precise. I bet you've always wondered which products are included in the local diet. It's simple. Nuts. This is the peanut. Well, I think it needs no introduction. And it's a high spot of our program. The high spot looks like an insect with a head. I think I'll eat it. Of course, I'll eat it. And another one. Same as with chips. What was that? The mopane worms are one of the most important dishes for the locals. Of course, they are a source of protein. In fact, one caterpillar is enough for me, and I'm full. It seems to me that parts of the worm are stuck in my mouth, stuck in my teeth. Oh, well. Let's check out one of the local villages. I have to admit, it's very clean here. Perfect red clay walls, wonderful roofs, and this giant stone. It obviously holds pride of place here. Good evening. Hello. Here, I had an excellent opportunity to pitch in to help some local women with their food preparation. And it's all about the vegetables. I don't know if they're good enough to be the living plant symbols of South Africa, but for food, they're definitely good enough. Nice going, ladies. You really know how to do it. But it doesn't look easy. Not sure if I can manage. Obviously, though, we're really going to appreciate the final product at the end. First of all, we'll break the kernels and only then we'll pound the grain on this stone so that we can cook it. It is corn. Maize. It's clear that corn has become a staple here and the locals are quite adept at preparing it. But I recall it was brought here by European settlers. I still want to find a plant that is endemic to the country. Meanwhile, I was offered a visit to the local healer and I couldn't refuse the invitation. I am not really comfortable using alternative medicine. Sometimes it can be a bit suspect, but I guess this is ancient African folk medicine, so I'll have to give it a try. Well, I was a bit disappointed. The experience didn't measure up to my ideas about ancient wizards and shamans. The time when medicine men could guess what the trouble was apparently ended long ago. In general, I'm quite healthy, so in order not to hurt the healer's feelings, I decided to tell her about my leg, which I broke when I was seven. Well, I could operate on your leg right now and ease the pain. An operation without anesthesia outside here on the ground? Well, of course I agree. Well, maybe it won't be such a serious procedure after all. But comfort is another matter. Oh, the things I do so that you can get an idea of traditional South African medicine. So, she's performing the operation, but on what? With my luck, she'll break my leg and then heal it again in front of our eyes. Listen, on my right leg, ah, ah, listen, my leg's just been pricked with a porcupine spine. If she lifts the porcupine spine above my knee, I'm out of here. But I was lucky. I paid too little or she decided I'm too fit to need curing. 
I was asked not to thank our highly respected healer because if I thank her, the spell won't work. So that's what we did. We just left not saying a word. Despite my getting to know the local medicine, I learned nothing special about medicinal herbs in South Africa. But I remembered in Kruger National Park, I saw a tree which could certainly lay claim to the title of the most biologically potent plant in the region. A very distinguished member of the local flora is this tree, which fully deserves its name, the candelabra tree. In the shape, it looks like a candelabra, but the most interesting thing about this tree is that it's poisonous. My friends, as you probably noticed, this plant looks like the well-known African milk tree, and they're indeed related. Well, the latter is smaller, but the candelabra tree is not even really a tree, but a cactus, albeit one that can grow up to 65 feet high. It's better not to touch the white stuff because it's a very poisonous substance, which makes this candelabra tree dangerous. Getting poisoned by a tree is a sensation which I'd rather not experience, so I don't recommend trying it out. If you see this tree in Africa, you'd better keep away from it. It's really dangerous. The locals use this juice for fishing. You just tear off a branch and go fishing, throw the branch in the water, and that's it. You can catch the fish with your hands. I didn't dare try seeing if such fish are edible for a visitor like me. I haven't found South Africa's most symbolic plant yet, so the risk isn't worth it. I decided my best chance to find the most emblematic plant would be in the most emblematic area of the park at the monument to its founder. Thank you, Paul Kruger. Born in Switzerland, but a true South African at heart. It's owing to him that this park exists. 12,500 square miles, playing host to all of the great African land animals. A truly living park. The park is really buzzing with animal activity. For instance, we got here late because baboons, elephants, and a lot of other fans of quick carbohydrates overtook us. This is another living symbol of South Africa, a marula tree. The fruit of a wild tree is truly good. The distribution of this species throughout Africa has followed the Bantu people in their migrations. You have to fight for this tree. As soon as its fruits ripen, animals rush to the marula tree at once. You can see this tree on liquor bottles, also called the elephant tree. It's the tree which migrated across the country along with the Aboriginal tribes long ago. A tree with a truly fascinating history, interesting background, and delicious fruit, which smells like turpentine. Yet, I can't find a single fruit. All of them have been picked already. I would be happy to call the marula tree the country's symbol, but since I didn't get to taste it, I really can't. I need to go on. You know, in my travels across the Republic of South Africa, I can't but be surprised at the fact that the animals are not afraid of people at all. Well, maybe they are to some extent, but not like our animals back home. These are common zebras. But to me, they're not commonplace. They live here. I'm now on their turf, and they aren't afraid of me. I don't know who's more afraid here. Do zebras attack people in general? I'm not willing to check it out. The fact is that zebras can be quite aggressive. Because of that, people failed to domesticate zebras, unlike their relatives, horses and donkeys. Herds of zebras are really good at fending off predators like lions, leopards, and all those who wish to treat themselves to their meat, you could say. Yet now they look quite calm. The most important thing is that I don't attack them. All in all, when you find yourself among wildlife, never make sudden moves because it could startle the animals. Okay, guys, I'm leaving. You know, during my search for the botanical symbol of South Africa, I've tried to get a closer look at any interesting vegetation I come across. This tree, for example. Look at its shape, its gigantic top, its strong root system. Looks a bit like a banyan to me, but it's a common Egyptian fig tree. Its name indicates that it came from Egypt. I don't know how it ended up in South Africa, but I'm sure it cannot be called the symbol of the country. 
But this is a truly beautiful and resilient plant. By the way, it's even mentioned in the Bible. Yet it's described in a different way there as a sycamore tree. I guess the distinctive feature of the local flora today is the abundance of invasive species. A lot of ecologists argue that this unique Cape Floristic Kingdom, that's what this area of extraordinarily high diversity and endemic species is called, should be protected from this international invasion. I guess the land here is so rich that any new trees or bushes won't do any harm to it. They could even benefit the locals. For example, we've long been used to various exotic plants for sale at the grocery store. Yet, when you see a real village vending table with bunches of mango and avocado on it, instead of the usual produce, it's still difficult to believe your own eyes. I need vitamins. A mango, please. 50 rand. An avocado? Don't you have avocados back home? No, no, we don't have any. Only in greenhouse. Okay, this is one of the main food symbols of South Africa. It's a 100% original avocado. It grows here. Yet avocado can't be a botanical symbol of Africa, as it's a typical American tree, which just took root here. Mango isn't an endemic plant either. It came from India. And what is this fruit? It's Narchi. Narchi? Yes. What is Narchi? Can I buy one just to taste? No. 30 rand. 30 rand for a pack, that's about $2. What is it? I just have to sample the quality of this. Can I buy one? Though they are a local fruit, citrus are not endemic here. They appeared in South Africa in the 17th century, owing to Jan van Rijbeck, the Dutch colonial administrator of the founder of Cape Town and the nation's founding father. Well, I guess I'm about to taste some kind of South African tangerine. If only you could experience the smell. Yes, it's a tangerine. It's a normal tangerine. But it got its color, you might say, from its relative, the lemon. But it's a tangerine. The indigenous people had no fruit trees or agriculture in general. So Van Rybeck ordered various seedlings brought to the colony. Let's taste some mango. I'll buy it later. I will. I just have to check. You know, back home, we taste everything before we buy it. I see you're not used to it because the quality is really high here. But you know, you don't find the diversity here we're used to. Yet this stall, it's a real fruit stall. On your way home from work, you come here, pick up some mango, and that's it. And you can make a salad out of avocado and mango. By the way, have you ever eaten a mango and avocado salad? In fact, I'd rather get more closely acquainted with the local agriculture. The endemic plants may not be grown for export here, Though, as I've already said, many imported and cultivated plants are a major part of the well-being of the country and its people. And I'm eager to find out how the most expensive product here grows. The most expensive nuts in the world. What is this nut called? It's a macadamia nut. Macadamia? That's right. Is that an Australian nut? Originally, they came from Australia, right? They have similar plants, and the temperature range here is the same, and this aids macadamia growth. Apparently, this is currently the biggest production facility in South Africa. If you travel across the country, you'll see that many farmers are giving up on citrus plants and sugarcane to grow macadamia trees. The whole world has a demand for macadamia nuts, but the supply doesn't meet the demand. This plant is resistant to insects, birds, and animals alike, and humans don't have it much easier. Even at the picking stage, it's so difficult that a single person can pick, well, two to 300 pounds. That's with shells, and the net weight will be 60 to 100 pounds. That's almost nothing. Though special equipment has been invented, hand picking is still impossible to replace. Uh, 
Now I'm going to show how you pick these expensive nuts with your own hands. By the way, these nuts are not only expensive, but quite greasy inside. It's not so simple to crack them open. 23 people are laboring on this plantation now. This work is backbreaking from what I can see because all day long, they walk stooped over to pick the most high quality nuts. From the ground, right? Yes, only from the ground. I wonder if labor unions provide some security. How many hours a day do you spend like that? Oh, really? Listen, no way. This is not for me. It's so hard walking like that. Now I understand why these nuts are so expensive. They are hand-picked, they grow in a truly green area, and they are tasty, attractive, and good for your health. The further process is no less difficult. It's really hard to get the nut out of its hard, pearly shell. The technology for removing the husk is a matter of pride for the producers and their trade secret as well. And who would reveal the secret of obtaining these kernels? They're really like diamonds, especially in terms of price, and I've eaten these nuts to my heart's content. Well, it's a nut, really. Well, an unusual nut. It has a special taste. It's really rich in fat, it's nutritious, and it's really healthy. Still, even though this plant provides work to the locals and generates good revenue for others, it still doesn't deserve to be called the living symbol of South Africa, in my opinion. After all, the locals don't eat it. At this point, I wondered what had fed the locals before the colonists brought their plants, and I remembered one of my friends who gains weight by drinking water. Do you recognize this tree? It's Adansonia digitata, the baobab. It's a true African symbol, a symbol of life and fertility. It's not for nothing that it's present on the coat of arms of at least two countries, Senegal and Central African Republic. Moreover, it's the national tree of Madagascar. In fact, the locals use this tree to the fullest extent. They make ropes from its bark, they eat its fruit, they make glue from its pollen, and even monkeys love it a lot. That's why it's sometimes called the monkey bread tree. And it's the thickest tree in the world. It can grow up to 26 feet in diameter. Cool. I was lucky to see a green baobab. As nine months out of the year, it's without any foliage. By the way, its bare skyward branches earned it the name of the upside down tree. The indigenous people had a funny legend about why this tree looks so peculiar. Baobab apparently was a truly boring and envious plant. When God created the palm tree, the baobab asked to be made taller. When flowers appeared, the baobab demanded the same. And when God created fruit-bearing trees, the baobab wanted to bear fruit as well. So God agreed, but he turned the baobab upside down in order not to hear its nagging and complaining anymore. And another interesting fact, these trees don't have any growth rings, so it's hard to tell how old they are. The baobab is a very resilient plant. Even if it falls down, lightning strikes it, or anything else happens, as long as at least one root is in the ground, the baobab will grow just as usual. It will bloom and bear fruit. And when it finally dies, it sags and turns into a heap of fiber, which disappears very quickly. For its resilience and for the fact that every inch of it is useful, from roots to leaves, and most importantly, that it saves people from hunger, the locals honor it as a sacred plant. The baobab is the protector of the earth for them. That is why I think the baobab deserves to be called the living symbol of South Africa.